Section 1. The Objective Prerequisites for a Socialist Revolution The world political situation as a whole is chiefly characterized by a historical crisis of the leadership of the proletariat. The economic prerequisite for the proletarian revolution has already in general achieved the highest point of fruition that can be reached under capitalism. Mankind's productive forces stagnate. Already, new inventions and improvements fail to raise the level of material wealth. Conjunctural crises under the conditions of the social crisis of the whole capitalist system inflict ever heavier deprivations and sufferings upon the masses. Growing unemployment, in its turn, deepens the financial crisis of the state and undermines the unstable monetary systems. Democratic regimes, as well as fascist, stagger on from one bankruptcy to another. The bourgeoisie itself sees no way out, and countries where it has already been forced to stake its last upon the card of fascism, it now toboggans with closed eyes toward an economic and military catastrophe. In the historically privileged countries, i.e. in those where the bourgeoisie can still for a certain period of time permit itself the luxury of democracy at the expense of national accumulations, Great Britain, France, United States, etc., all of capital's traditional parties are in a state of perplexity bordering on a paralysis of will. The New Deal, despite its first period of pretentious resoluteness, represents but a special form of political perplexity, possible only in a country where the bourgeoisie succeeded in accumulating incalculable wealth. The present crisis, far from having run its full course, has already succeeded in showing that New Deal politics, like popular front politics in France, opens no new exit from the economic blind alley. International relations present no better picture. Under the increasing tension of capitalist disintegration, imperialist antagonisms reach an impasse at the height of which separate clashes and bloody local disturbances Ethiopia, Spain, the Far East, Central Europe, must inevitably coalesce into a conflagration of world dimensions. The bourgeoisie, of course, is aware of the mortal danger to its domination represented by a new war. But that class is now immeasurably less capable of averting war than on the eve of 1914. All talk to the effect that historical conditions have not yet ripened for socialism is the product of ignorance or conscious deception. The objective prerequisites for the proletarian revolution have not only ripened, they have begun to get somewhat rotten. Without a socialist revolution in the next historical period at that, a catastrophe threatens the whole culture of mankind. The turn is now to the proletariat, i.e., chiefly to its revolutionary vanguard. The historical crisis of mankind is reduced to the crisis of the revolutionary leadership. Section 2. The Proletariat and Its Leadership The economy, the state, the politics of the bourgeoisie and its international relations are completely blighted by a social crisis characteristic of a pre-revolutionary state of society. The chief obstacle in the path of transforming the pre-revolutionary into a revolutionary state is the opportunist character of proletarian leadership. Its petty bourgeois cowardice before the big bourgeoisie and its perfidious connection with it, even in its death agony. In all countries, the proletariat is racked by a deep disquiet. The multi-millioned masses again and again enter the road of revolution, but each time they are blocked by their own conservative bureaucratic machines. 
The Spanish proletariat has made a series of heroic attempts since April of 1931 to take power in its hands and guide the fate of society. However, its own parties, Social Democrats, Stalinists, Anarchists, POUMists, each in its own way, acted as a break and thus prepared Franco's triumphs. In France, the great wave of sit-down strikes, particularly during June of 1936, revealed the wholehearted readiness of the proletariat to overthrow the capitalist system. However, the leading organizations, socialists, Stalinists, syndicalists, under the label of the Popular Front, succeeded in canalizing and damming, at least temporarily, the revolutionary stream. The unprecedented wave of sit-down strikes and the amazingly rapid growth of industrial unionism in the United States, the CIO, is the most indisputable expression of the instinctive striving of the American workers to raise themselves to the level of the tasks imposed on them by history. But here, too, the leading political organizations, including the newly created CIO, do everything possible to keep in check and paralyze the revolutionary pressure of the masses. The definite passing over of the common turn to the side of bourgeois order, its cynically counter-revolutionary role throughout the world, particularly in Spain, France, the United States, and other democratic countries, created exceptional supplementary difficulties for the world proletariat. Under the banner of the October Revolution, the conciliatory politics practiced by the People's Front doom the working class to impotence and clear the road for fascism. People's Fronts on the one hand, fascism on the other. These are the last political resources of imperialism in the struggle against the proletarian revolution. From the historical point of view, however, both these resources are stopgaps. The decay of capitalism continues under the sign of the Phrygian cap in France as under the sign of the swastika in Germany. Nothing short of the overthrow of the bourgeoisie can open a road out. The orientation of the masses is determined first by the objective conditions of decaying capitalism, and second, by the treacherous politics of the old workers' organizations. Of these factors, the first, of course, is the decisive one. The laws of history are stronger than the bureaucratic apparatus. No matter how the methods of the social betrayers differ from the social legislation of Bloom to the judicial frame-ups of Stalin, they will never succeed in breaking the revolutionary will of the proletariat. As time goes on, their desperate efforts to hold back the wheel of history will demonstrate more clearly to the masses that the crisis of the proletarian leadership, having become the crisis in mankind's culture, can be resolved only by the Fourth International. Section 3. The Minimum Program and the Transitional Program the strategic task of the next period, pre-revolutionary period of agitation, propaganda, and organization, consists in overcoming the contradiction between the maturity of the objective revolutionary conditions and the immaturity of the proletariat and its vanguard, the confusion and disappointment of the older generation, the inexperience of the younger generation. It is necessary to help the masses in the process of the daily struggle to find the bridge between the present demand and the socialist program of the revolution. This bridge should include a system of transitional demands, stemming from today's conditions and from today's consciousness of wide layers of the working class and unalterably leading to one final conclusion, the conquest of power by the proletariat. Classical social democracy, functioning in an epoch of progressive capitalism, divided its program into two parts, independent of each other. The minimum program, which limited itself to reforms within the framework of bourgeois society, and the maximum program, 
which promised substitution of socialism for capitalism in the indefinite future. Between the minimum and the maximum program, no bridge existed, and indeed, social democracy has no need of such a bridge, since the word socialism is used only for holiday speechifying. The common turn has set out to follow the path of social democracy in an epoch of decaying capitalism, when, in general, there can be no discussion of systematic social reforms in the raising of the masses' living standards, when every serious demand of the proletariat, and even every serious demand of the petty bourgeoisie, inevitably reaches beyond the limits of capitalist property relations and of the bourgeois state. The strategic task of the Fourth International lies not in reforming capitalism, but in its overthrow. Its political aim is the conquest of power by the proletariat for the purpose of expropriating the bourgeoisie. However, the achievement of this strategic task is unthinkable without the most considered attention to all, even small and partial, questions of tactics. All sections of the proletariat, all its layers, occupations, and groups should be drawn into the revolutionary movement. The present epoch is distinguished not for the fact that it frees the revolutionary party from day-to-day -day work, but because it permits this work to be carried on indissolubly with the actual tasks of the revolution. The Fourth International does not discard the program of the old minimal demands to the degree to which these have preserved at least part of their vital forcefulness. Indefatigably, it defends the democratic rights and social conquests of the workers, but it carries on this day-to-day -day work within the framework of the correct, actual, that is, revolutionary, perspective. Insofar as the old partial minimal demands of the masses clash with the destructive and degrading tendencies of decadent capitalism, and this occurs at each step, the Fourth International advances a system of transitional demands, the essence of which is contained in the fact that ever more openly and decisively they will be directed against the very bases of the bourgeois regime. The old minimal program is superseded by the transitional program, the task of which lies in systematic mobilization of the masses for the proletarian revolution. Section 4. Sliding Scale of Wages and Sliding Scale of Hours Under the conditions of disintegrating capitalism, the masses continue to live the meagerized life of the oppressed, threatened now, more than at any other time, with the danger of being cast into the pit of pauperism. They must defend their mouthful of bread if they cannot increase or better it. There is neither the need nor the opportunity to enumerate here those separate partial demands which time and again arise on the basis of concrete circumstances, national, local, trade union, but two basic economic afflictions in which is summarized the increasing absurdity of the capitalist system, that is, unemployment and high prices, demand generalized slogans and methods of struggle. The Fourth International declares uncompromising war on the politics of the capitalists, which, to a considerable degree, like the politics of their agents, the reformists, aims to place the whole burden of militarism, the crisis, the disorientation of the monetary system, and all other scourges stemming from capitalism's death agony upon the backs of the toilers. The Fourth International demands employment and decent living conditions for all. Neither monetary inflation nor stabilization can serve as slogans for the proletariat, because these are but two ends of the same stick. Against a bounding rise in prices, which with the approach of war will assume an ever more unbridled character, one can fight only under the slogan of a sliding scale of wages, 
This means that collective agreements should assure an automatic rise in wages in relation to the increase in price of consumer goods. Under the menace of its own disintegration, the proletariats cannot permit the transformation of an increasing section of the workers into chronically unemployed paupers, living off the slops of a crumbling society. The right to employment is the only serious rights left to the worker in a society based upon exploitation. This right today is left to the worker in a society based upon exploitation. This right today is being shorn from him at every step. Against unemployment, structural as well as conjunctural, the time is ripe to advance along with the slogan of public works, the slogan of a sliding scale of working hours. Trade unions and other mass organizations should bind the workers and the unemployed together in the solidarity of mutual responsibility. On this basis, all the work on hand would then be divided among all existing workers in accordance with how the extent of the working week is defined. The average wage of every worker remains the same as it was under the old working week. Wages under a strictly guaranteed minimum would follow the movement of prices. It is impossible to accept any other program for the present catastrophic period. Property owners and their lawyers will prove the unrealizability of these demands. Smaller, especially ruined capitalists, in addition, will refer to their account ledgers. The workers categorically denounce such conclusions and references. The question is not one of normal collision between opposing material interests. The question is one of guarding the proletariat from decay, demoralization, and ruin. The question is one of life or death of the only creative and progressive class and by that token of the future of mankind. If capitalism is incapable of satisfying the demands inevitably arising from the calamities generated by itself, then let it perish. Realizability or unrealizability is in the given instance a question of the relationship of forces which can be decided only by the struggle. By means of this struggle, no matter what immediate practical successes may be, the workers will best come to understand the necessity of liquidating capitalist slavery. Section 5. Trade Unions in the Transitional Epoch In the struggle for partial and transitional demands, the workers, now more than ever before, need mass organizations, principally in the form of trade unions. The powerful growth of trade unionism in France and the United States is the best refutation of the preachments of those ultra-left doctrinaires who have been teaching that trade unions have outlived their usefulness. The Bolshevik Leninist stands in the front-line trenches of all kinds of struggles, even when they involve only the most modest material interests or democratic rights of the working class. He takes active part in mass trade unions for the purpose of strengthening them and raising their spirit of militancy. He fights uncompromisingly against any attempt to subordinate the unions to the bourgeois state and bind the proletariat to compulsory arbitration and every other form of police guardianship not only fascist but also democratic. Only on the basis of such work within the trade unions is successful struggle possible against the reformists, including those of the Stalinist bureaucracy. Sectarian attempts to build or preserve small revolutionary unions as a second edition of the party signify in actuality the renouncing of the struggle for leadership of the working class. It is necessary to establish this firm rule. Self-isolation of the capitulationist variety from the mass trade unions, which is tantamount to a betrayal of the revolution, is incompatible with membership in the Fourth International. At the same time, 
the fourth international resolutely rejects and condemns trade union fetishism equally characteristic of trade unionists and syndicalists trade unions do not offer and in line with their task composition and manner of recruiting membership cannot offer a finished revolutionary program in consequence they cannot replace the party the building of national revolutionary parties as sections of the fourth international is the central task of the transitional epoch trade unions even the most powerful embrace no more than twenty to twenty five per cent of the working class and at that predominantly the more skilled and better paid layers the more oppressed majority of the working class is drawn only episodically into the struggle during a period of exceptional upsurges in the labor movement during such moments it is necessary to create organizations ad hoc embracing the whole fighting mass strike committees factory committees and finally soviets as organizations expressive of the top layers of the proletariat trade unions as witnessed by all past historical experience including the fresh experience of the anarcho-syndicalist unions in spain developed powerful tendencies toward compromise with the bourgeois democratic regime in periods of acute class struggle the leading bodies of the trade unions aim to become masters of the mass movement in order to render it harmless this is already occurring during the period of simple strikes especially in the case of the mass sit-down strikes which shake the principle of bourgeois property in time of war or revolution when the bourgeoisie is plunged into exceptional difficulties trade union leaders usually become bourgeois ministers therefore the sections of the fourth international should always strive not only to renew the top leadership of the trade unions boldly and resolutely in critical moments advancing new militant leaders in place of routine functionaries and careerists but also to create in all possible instances independent militant organizations corresponding more closely to the tasks of the mass struggle against bourgeois society and if necessary not flinching even in the face of a direct break with the conservative apparatus of the trade unions if it be criminal to turn one's back on mass organizations for the sake of fostering sectarian factions it is no less so passively to tolerate subordination of the revolutionary mass movement to the control of openly reactionary or disguised conservative progressive bureaucratic cliques trade unions are not ends in themselves they are but means along the road to proletarian revolution section six factory committees during a transitional epoch the workers movement does not have a systematic and well-balanced but a feverish and explosive character slogans as well as organizational forms should be subordinated to the indices of the movement on guard against routine handling of a situation as against a plague the leadership should respond sensitively to the initiative of the masses sit-down strikes the latest expression of this kind of initiative go beyond the limits of normal capitalist procedure independently of the demands of the strikers the temporary seizure of factories deals a blow to the idle capitalist property every sit-down strike poses in a practical manner the question of who is boss of the factory the capitalists or the workers if the sit-down strike raises this question episodically the factory committee gives it organized expression elected by all the factory employees the factory committee immediately creates a counterweight to the will of the administration to the reformist criticism of bosses of the so-called economic royalist type like ford in contradiction to good democratic exploiters 
we counterpose the slogan of factory committees as centers of struggle against both the first and the second trade union bureaucrats will as a general rule resist the creation of factory committees just as they resist every bold step along the road of mobilizing the masses however the wider the sweep of the movement the easier will it be to break this resistance where the closed shop has already been instituted in peaceful times the committee will formally coincide with its usual organ of the trade union but will renew its personnel and widen its functions the prime significance of the committee however lies in the fact that it becomes the militant staff for such working-class layers as the trade union is usually incapable of moving to action it is precisely from these more oppressed layers that the most self-sacrificing battalions of the revolution will come from the moment that the committee makes its appearance a factual dual power is established in the factory by its very essence it represents the transitional state because it includes in itself two irreconcilable regimes the capitalist and the proletarian this fundamental significance of factory committees is precisely contained in the fact that they open the doors if not to a direct revolutionary then to a pre-revolutionary period between the bourgeois and proletarian regimes that the propagation of the factory committee idea is neither premature nor artificial is amply attested to by the waves of sit-down strikes spreading through several countries new waves of this type will be inevitable in the immediate future it is necessary to begin a campaign in favor of factory committees in time in order not to be caught unawares section seven business secrets and workers control of industry liberal capitalism based upon competition and free trade has completely receded into the past its successor monopolistic capitalism not only does not mitigate the anarchy of the market but on the contrary imparts to it a particularly convulsive character the necessity of controlling economy of placing state guidance over industry and of planning is today recognized at least in words by almost all current bourgeois and petty bourgeois tendencies from fascist to social democratic with the fascists it is mainly a question of planned plundering of the people for military purposes the social democrats prepare to drain the ocean of anarchy with spoonfuls of bureaucratic planning engineers and professors write articles about technocracy in their cowardly experiments in regulation democratic governments run headlong into the invincible sabotage of big capital the actual relationship existing between the exploiters and the democratic controllers is best characterized by the fact that the gentlemen reformers stop short in pious trepidation before the threshold of the trusts and their business secrets here the principle of non-interference with business dominates the accounts kept between the individual capitalist and society remain the secret of the capitalist they are not the concern of society the motivation offered for the principle of business secrets is ostensibly as in the epoch of liberal capitalism that of free competition in reality the trusts keep no secrets from one another the business secrets of the present epoch are part of a persistent plot of monopoly capitalism against the interests of society projects for limiting the autocracy of economic royalists will continue to be pathetic farces as long as private owners of the social means of production can hide from producers and consumers the machinations of exploitation robbery and fraud the abolition of business secrets is the first step toward actual control of industry
workers no less than capitalists have the right to know the secrets of the factory of the trust of the whole branch of industry of the national economy as a whole first and foremost banks heavy industry and centralized transport should be placed under an observation glass the immediate tasks of workers control should be to obtain the debits and credits of society beginning with individual business undertakings to determine the actual share of the national income appropriated by individual capitalists and by the exploiters as a whole to expose the behind-the-scenes deals and swindles of banks and trusts finally to reveal to all members of society that unconscionable squandering of human labor which is the result of capitalist anarchy and the naked pursuit of profits no office holder of the bourgeois state is in a position to carry out this work no matter with how great authority one would wish to endow him all the world was witness to the impotence of President Roosevelt and Premier Bloom against the plottings of the sixty or two hundred families of their respective nations. To break the resistance of the exploiters, the mass pressure of the proletariat is necessary. Only factory committees can bring about real control of production, calling in as consultants but not as technocrats specialists sincerely devoted to the people accountants statisticians engineers scientists etc the struggle against unemployment is not to be considered without the calling for a broad and bold organization of public works but public works can have a continuous and progressive significance for society as for the unemployed themselves only when they are made part of a general plan worked out to cover a considerable number of years within the framework of this plan the workers would demand resumption as public utilities of work in private businesses closed as a result of the crisis workers control in such case would be replaced by direct workers management the working out of even the most elementary economic plan from the point of view of the exploited not the exploiters is impossible without workers control that is without the penetration of the workers eye into all open and concealed springs of capitalist economy committees representing individual business enterprises should meet at conference to choose corresponding committees of trusts whole branches of industry economic regions and finally of national industry as a whole thus workers control becomes a school for planned economy on the basis of the experience of control the proletariat will prepare itself for direct management of nationalized industry when the hour for that eventually strikes to those capitalists mainly in the lower and middle strata who of their own accord sometimes offer to throw open their books to the workers usually to demonstrate the necessity of lowering wages the workers answer that they are not interested in the bookkeeping of individual bankrupts or semi-bankrupts but in the account ledgers of all the exploiters as a whole the workers cannot and do not wish to accommodate the level of their living conditions to the exigencies of individual capitalists themselves victims of their own regime the task is one of reorganizing the whole system of production and distribution on a more dignified and workable basis if the abolition of business secrets be a necessary condition to workers control then control is the first step along the road to the socialist guidance of the economy section eight the expropriation of separate groups of capitalists the socialist program of expropriation i e 
of political overthrow of the bourgeoisie and liquidation of its economic domination should in no case during the present transitional period hinder us from advancing when the occasion warrants the demand for the expropriation of several key branches of industry vital for the national existence or of the most parasitic group of the bourgeoisie thus in answer to the pathetic jeremiads of the gentlemen democrats anent the dictatorship of the sixty families of the united states or the two hundred families of france we counterpose the demand for the expropriation of these sixty or two hundred feudalistic capitalist overlords in precisely the same way we demand the expropriation of the corporations holding monopolies on war industries, railroads, the most important sources of raw materials, etc. The difference between these demands and the muddle-headed reformist slogan of nationalization lies in the following. 1. We reject indemnification. 2. We warn the masses against the demagogues of the People's Front who, giving lip service to nationalization, remain in reality agents of capital. 3. We call upon the masses to rely only upon their own revolutionary strength. 4. We link up the question of expropriation with that of seizure of the power by the workers and the farmers. The necessity of advancing the slogan of expropriation in the course of daily agitation in partial form, and not only in our propaganda in its more comprehensive aspects, is dictated by the fact that different branches of industry are on different levels of development, occupy a different place in the life of society, and pass through different stages of the class struggle. Only a general revolutionary upsurge of the proletariat can place the complete expropriation of the bourgeoisie on the order of the day. The task of transitional demands is to prepare the proletariat to solve this problem. Section 9. Expropriation of the Private Banks and Statization of the Credit System Imperialism means the domination of finance capital. Side by side with the trusts and the syndicates, and very frequently rising above them, the banks concentrate in their hands the actual command over the economy. In their structure, the banks express in a concentrated form the entire structure of modern capital. They combine tendencies of monopoly with tendencies of anarchy. They organize the miracles of technology, giant enterprises, mighty trusts, and they also organize high prices, crises, and unemployment. It is impossible to take a single serious step in the struggle against monopolistic despotism and capitalist anarchy, which supplement one another in their work of destruction, if the commanding posts of banks are left in the hands of predatory capitalists. In order to create a unified system of investments and credits along a rational plan corresponding to the interests of the entire people, it is necessary to merge all the banks into a single national institution. Only the expropriation of the private banks and the concentration of the entire credit system in the hands of the states will provide the latter with the necessary actual, i.e. material, resources and not merely paper and bureaucratic resources, for economic planning. The expropriation of the banks in no case implies the expropriation of bank deposits. On the contrary, the single bank will be able to create much more favorable conditions for the small depositors than could the private banks. In the same way, only the state bank can establish for farmers, tradesmen, and small merchants conditions of favorable, that is, cheap, credit. Even more important, however, is the circumstance that the entire economy, first and foremost large-scale industry and transport, directed by a single financial staff, will serve the vital interests of the workers and all other toilers. 
However, the statization of the banks will produce these favorable results only if the state power itself passes completely from the hands of the exploiters into the hands of the toilers. Section 10. The Picket Line, Defense Groups, Workers' Militia, The Arming of the Proletariat Sit-down strikes are a serious warning from the masses addressed not only to the bourgeoisie, but also to the organizations of the workers, including the Fourth International. In 1919-1920, the Italian workers seized factories on their own initiative, thus signaling the news to their leaders of the coming of the social revolution. The leaders paid no heed to the signal. The victory of fascism was the result. Sit-down strikes do not yet mean the seizure of factories in the Italian manner, but they are a decisive step toward such seizures. The present crisis can sharpen the class struggle to an extreme point and bring nearer the moment of denouement. But that does not mean that a revolutionary situation comes on at one stroke. Actually, its approach is signalized by a continuous series of convulsions. One of these is the wave of sit-down strikes. The problem of the sections of the Fourth International is to help the proletarian vanguard understand the general character and tempo of our epoch and to fructify in time the struggles of the masses with ever more resolute and militant organizational measures. The sharpening of the proletariat's struggle means the sharpening of the methods of counterattack on the part of capital. New waves of sit-down strikes can call forth, and undoubtedly will call forth, resolute countermeasures on the part of the bourgeoisie. Preparatory work is already being done by the confidential staffs of big trusts. Woe to the revolutionary organizations, woe to the proletariat, if it is again caught unawares. The bourgeoisie is nowhere satisfied with official police and army. In the United States, even during peaceful times, the bourgeoisie maintains militarized battalions of scabs and privately armed thugs in factories. To this must now be added the various groups of American Nazis. The French bourgeoisie, at the first approach of danger, mobilized semi-legal and illegal fascist detachments, including such as are in the army. No sooner does the pressure of the English workers once again become stronger than immediately the fascist bands are doubled, trebled, increased tenfold, to come out in bloody march against the workers. The bourgeoisie keeps itself most accurately informed about the fact that in the present epoch, the class struggle irresistibly tends to transform itself into civil war. The examples of Italy, Germany, Austria, Spain, and other countries taught considerably more to the magnates and lackeys of capital than to the official leaders of the proletariat. The politicians of the Second and Third Internationals, as well as the bureaucrats of the trade unions, consciously close their eyes to the bourgeoisie's private army. Otherwise, they could not preserve their alliance with it, even for 24 hours. The reformists systematically implant in the minds of the workers the notion that the sacredness of democracy is best guaranteed when the bourgeoisie is armed to the teeth and the workers are unarmed. The duty of the Fourth International is to put an end to such slavish politics once and for all. The petty bourgeois democrats, including social democrats, Stalinists, and anarchists, yell louder about the struggle against fascism, the more cravenly they capitulate to it in actuality. Only armed workers' detachments, who feel the support of tens of millions of toilers behind them, can successfully prevail against the fascist bands. The struggle against fascism does not start in the liberal editorial office, but in the factory, and ends in the streets. Scabs and private gunmen in factory plants are the basic nuclei of the fascist army. Strike pickets are the basic nuclei of the proletarian army. This is our point of departure. In connection with every strike and street demonstration, 
it is imperative to propagate the necessity of creating workers' groups for self-defense. It is necessary to write this slogan into the program of the revolutionary wing of the trade unions. It is imperative everywhere possible, beginning with the youth groups, to organize groups for self-defense, to drill and acquaint them with the use of arms. A new upsurge of the mass movement should serve not only to increase the number of these units, but also to unite them according to neighborhoods, cities, regions. It is necessary to give organized expression to the valid hatred of the workers towards scabs and bands of gangsters and fascists. It is necessary to advise the slogan of a workers' militia as the one serious guarantee for the inviolability of workers' organizations, meetings, and press. Only with the help of such systematic persistence, indefatigable, courageous, agitational, and organizational work, always on the basis of the experience of the masses themselves, is it possible to root out from their consciousness the traditions of submissiveness and passivity, to train detachments of heroic fighters capable of setting an example to all toilers, to inflict a series of tactical defeats upon the armed thugs of counter-revolution, to raise the self-confidence of the exploited and oppressed, to compromise fascism in the eyes of the petty bourgeois, and pave the road for the conquest of power of the proletariat. Engels defined the state as bodies of armed men. The arming of the proletariat is an imperative, concomitant element to its struggle for liberation. When the proletariat wills it, it will find the road and the means to arming. In this field also, the leadership falls naturally to the sections of the Fourth International.